last sec session of the financial workshop. Um, again, there is a fourth optional session that will happen November 9th. If you have not yet signed up for the home ownership panel, please let me know. Send me an email. I will send you the um, registration form for you to uh, register for that. So far, I believe we have about 19 people register. So we're like super excited about that. We will provide dinner. It will be in person at the East Hartford Library in the lower level. And we'll have amazing, amazing um, uh, presenters and information for you on that day. So um, one thing that Amy, she is not able to join us today. She had a lot going on um, with meetings late night and also children activities. So she just wanted to say thank you to everyone. And she hopes to see you all in person on that day. Um, but Amy made sure that she shared with me that she wanted us to have an icebreaker today, um, kind of following back on our last uh, session where we talked about budgeting and we talked about saving money and just for you to turn anyone who wants to share one away that you shared money since last week. And I think I will start. Um, as you guys know, I am a Duncan freak and I go there every day for a coffee and a bagel. And after me and Amy having a conversation, because I do want to own a home and, um, her calculating how much money I was spending, like $4,000 a year on Dunkin', she, uh, we kind of made the decision that I was going to stop going to Dunkin' to purchase. So I just want to say that so far, so good. I have not been to Dunkin' um, ever since our conversation on Tuesday, and I've been uh, making coffee at work and um, bringing uh, food from home for lunch and for breakfast. So I have been improving. And so far I feel okay about it. Um, there's been days where I'm like, oh, should I go to Dunkin'? And I automatically think about a new home and how happy that will make me. So I have not. So um, I I'm really excited about those changes. And just to think that I am saving money in the process for, for my goal is, is a motivation on its own. So uh, I want to just pass it along. If you are someone who can want to share how you saved the money this week, please just uh, feel free to unmute and share. Um, I um, I'm a, I'm a big like Amazon shopper. I have two kids and work, and so it's just so easy, like two click, and that's it. He can be there in two days. So I've I'm on a, an Amazon freeze for the next two months and just because I think it's, it's a lot of impulse buy. I mean, you need it, but you don't really need it. So I uh, I got to stay away from that. It's just too easy. Awesome. Congratulations. Yes. Who else have a story? <laughs> Hi. Um, I will say that I revamped or revised my budget for November, not yet for October, because I feel like I've already done pretty terrible for October, but I revised it for November and I'm ready to actually go back to sticking to my budget and awesome. planning in advance. So yeah, that's what I'm doing. Yay. Congratulations. Who Thank else you. Would like, who else would like to share? Hello, my name is Jackie. I um I'm a I'm a board spender. So I've been to the store um several times since the last meeting, but I did not board spend. I only bought what was necessary. So that's a very big step for me. Yes, that's awesome. Yes. Thank you. Everyone. My my name is Alexandra, and I would like to say that I've come a long way um, towards saving my money because I used to be an impulsive spender. I used to buy things that I didn't really need. And so 
um, since the last meeting, I've just realized and then evaluated my spending and then realized that I don't really need all these things that I've been buying. And so some of those items, some of those items, uh, giving them out to people, selling them at a discount price, um, items I don't really need. And there's also this um, thing with my bank card that I can also save um, a percentage of my money whenever I use my bank card. So whenever I use it, um, let's say like 5% is going to go into savings. And that one, um, that, um, the savings, I'm not going to access it anytime soon. So I believe I'm doing great in my financial life um, towards my saving goals. Yes, I need to talk to you. <laughs> He's doing awesome. That is great. Thank you for sharing. Anyone else? Okay, uh, I'll pass it over to the ladies. Um, what kind of feedback would you give back, ladies? Uh, that was awesome. Um, so the rest of you who didn't say anything, um, I'm sure you guys all did something. You maybe were a little shy tonight. So um, keep up the good work. And I love the um, people who really um realized they were impulse buying or buying because they were bored and stopped to think about that before making purchases <clears throat> so that was great so keep it up and even though this is our last um class uh virtual class um you know if you go to the home buying class i want you to come up to me and let me know something that you have saved and that you have like two weeks in between so in those two weeks, um, keep it going and um, let us know what's happening. Yes, and I see that Maurice um, said on the chat that he reduced uh, his habit of eating out and was able to save money from that. So awesome. That's awesome, Maurice. That's great. great. Yeah. I know sometimes I know uh, last week we were, my uh, son and I had wanted to order some pizza down the road and you know we're picking out some things we're going to order from the restaurant and we called and no one and they didn't answer right away and I said you know we had um some things we could make our own pizza so we said all right and we just did that and we ended up saving you know probably forty dollars so yep there's lots of little things that you can do Lori yeah, did you have any tips because I know you're always really good with budgeting and weren't able to make it last week. <laughs> well, I have I have my three big ones that I usually talk about when I teach budgeting classes. But um, you know, one is the 72 hour rule, which is basically, you know, I mean, I'm a spender, I'm an admitted spender. <laughs> um, but I know myself well. So I put the barriers in place so that I can keep myself contained, you know, and that's really at the end of the day, like, that's what we have to do. It's not that it's, you know, we have to change behavior, but you're not going to necessarily change your nature, right? So you need to understand your nature and then be able to build the structure around those things so that you can, you know, produce successful outcomes. So I have a couple of different things. So the 72 hour rule is if I am in an impulse buy situation. Um, what I will do is I will put that item back. I know this is hard. It, it takes a lot of uh, discipline, but you put the item back and you wait 72 hours because with impulse buying, we know what that is, right? It's like the squirrel moment. <laughs> You know, we see the thing, it's bright and shiny. Um, it's in the line of, you know, we're all familiar with this line at TJ Maxx and Marshalls, right? Where, you know, literally you've done your shopping and then you get in that line where the crazy, you know, impulse buy line um, where everything is just there and, you know, available for you to, to grab. So in those instances, I will put that item back. And if I'm thinking about it 72 hours later, I will allow myself within budget to go back and get it. Most oftentimes though, like 99.9% .9 of the time, once I leave the store and I'm on to the next thing, I am not thinking about that item anymore. So, and that's the whole idea behind impulse buying, right? Is that you 
see it, it's impulsive and you purchase it. But if you give yourself a moment to sort of think about that and have clarity, um, then you're likely not to go back and repeat and make that purchase. Um, the other two things that I do is I have a bank account that is in Wallingford, Connecticut. I do not live in Wallingford. I live about 45 minutes away from Wallingford. <laughs> um, I do not have a ATM card. I do not have a checking, a check, uh, checkbook related to that account. I don't have anything where I can access it without going to that place, getting in my car, driving 45 minutes when they're open um, to be able to access those funds. So just putting that distance and that lack of accessibility for me is really helpful in helping me maintain those savings. And the last thing that I do is I take a stick note and I wrap it around my ATM and my credit cards and I write my goal on the sticky note so that every time I pull those cards out of my wallet, my goal is staring me in the face. Wow, that is awesome. Those are great <laughs> tips. Absolutely. I am going to steal some of those. I need it. I definitely need a bank account that is far away from me. And I don't have no access to it unless I drive really far. And I don't really like to drive. So that will really yeah. help. Yeah, it does. It helps. It makes a difference. Yeah. 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 Cool. They make a difference. I mean, one of the biggest things is know, know yourself. You know, when you're doing your finances, it's very easy for us to tell each other, to tell our ourselves a story about what is actually happening. Um, we don't like to admit to the things that we're not, you know, incredibly proud of um, about ourselves in terms of our spending habits. And so we, we create this narrative around it. And I think being completely honest with yourself about your behaviors and your triggers and really thinking about money as more than just a financial transaction, but really thinking about it in terms of the psychological um, sort of impacts and how shopping makes us feel, how, you know, the expenditure of money or how the products that we and services that we buy make us feel um, in our lives and, and how our spending habits align with those things is really an important thing to keep in mind. Um, and then again, creating those situations and the structure around those things so that you can build success despite what you're spending sort of tendencies tend to be. Great. Thank you so much, ladies. And I will um, just leave the floor to you guys to start the session for today. Thank you. Okay. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick this off um, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a claim, a little bit of a precursor before I start. So tax law, as you guys know, um, people hear the word taxes and they hear and they are like, oh my God. <laughs> it's, you know, it's overwhelming. It's a, can be a little bit scary sometimes. Um, the law changes all the time. Um, so I want to just tell you up front that this will be a fair amount of information um, this evening. If you have specific questions, please stop me or write something in chat. And Pam, I can't see the chat. So if you could um, maybe monitor that for me or um, yeah, the other, sure. if you wouldn't mind doing that e either. Um, so that I can answer any questions that you might have. Um, I do not profess to know every single inch of tax law. <laughs> um, tax law is enormous, but I will do my best um, to answer any questions that you might, might have that would be specific to you. Um, what we're going to talk about tonight is going to be sort of a general conversation about sort of the essential building blocks of tax law. Um, which is going to be um, your filing status, um, essentially what makes up the tax code, and a little bit about um, claiming dependence. And we're going to talk a little bit about those things in general. We'll talk about some tax credits, um, and then we'll get to any questions that you might have. Does that sound like a plan, everyone? Okay. All right, cool. Okay. So we're going to get into filing basics first. So basically the process, right? So we all know that when we file our tax return, we are submitting what is essentially one form, um, which is called our 1040, okay? Um, now, what happens though, is you're going, well, Laura, you know, I have all these documents 
documents that I get when I file my tax return. There's all these schedules and there's all these other documents that are related to it. Um, but those documents actually are the pieces that make up, right? They're going to inform the 1040. The document that the IRS really cares about is that one document. Okay, so what does that document include? And how do we sort of get to the I owe money or I'm getting a refund back? <laughs> So we'll go to those basic processes first. So what um, the return is going to ask for is your demographics. That's the top of the return. So the first thing you're going to see is your name, your social, your marital status, all of those kinds of things. Keep in mind that the marital status, when they ask you if you are married or unmarried, they are asking you if you are legally married. <laughs> okay. And this is a really important distinction because the filing status that you are putting on your tax return is again a building block for the rest of the return so if you are not putting the right filing status in your return could potentially be in error okay so we want to make sure that we're getting your filing status correct and so we will talk about what those filing statuses are and how to select the proper one in just a little bit the next piece is going to be your income okay and that's made up of what you earn okay and also your sort of passive income or unearned income, okay? So we're gonna talk about the differences between those two things, okay? And then that total is going to be what you're reporting to the IRS. Keep in mind, the IRS wants you to report all money, okay? Unofficial and official, okay? There's no such thing at the IRS as under the table. <laughs> Doesn't exist for them. Um, they want money to be reported. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, once you get all of your income in there, we're going to do what's called adjusting your income. Okay. So that means um, that if there's particular uh, credits that are going to apply to you, they are actually going to take that income and reduce the amount that you're reporting by that amount. Okay. So I'm going to have a visual of this in just a minute to make this a little bit easier to sort of, you know, a visual to help you understand. Um, but that's going to be what's called your adjusted gross income or your AGI. Okay. All right. And again, stop me, ask questions if you have any questions um, throughout this. Okay. So once we have the AGI, okay, then what they do is they are going to apply either the standard deduction or the itemized deduction. And when you're filling out your tax tax return. Um, this is an automatic calculation, so it's not a number that you necessarily need to remember, okay? The key is, is to understand if you're supposed to take the standard or if you're supposed to take the itemized deductions. Now, when the law changed a couple of years ago, so when President Trump was in office, he doubled the standard deduction. So that actually pushed a lot of people, including myself, um, out of the itemized deductions, because when you use itemized deductions in the past, has been typically when you own a home. And when you own a home, you have a lot, especially in Connecticut, <laughs> a lot of expenses related to the home ownership pieces. The taxes are very high um, and all of those kinds of things. So with all of those expenses, you were able to take itemized deductions. But what has happened is, is because um, the Trump uh, administration doubled the standard deduction, many people now fall into the standard deduction. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. It just changes the amount of money um, that is being reduced from your adjusted gross income. So this is essentially when it comes down to it, a very big math problem that we're going to talk about just a little bit. Okay. Um, so once you have subtracted your itemized or your standard deduction, then they are going to apply tax credits to you if they are applicable to your particular situation. Okay. So a lot of you have heard of the earned income tax credit, okay? Um, if you are eligible for that credit, they will then apply that to this calculation that we're in the midst of doing, okay? And this will make a lot more sense when you see the visual. Um, once you have your tax credits applied, then they basically determine, okay, based on this whole picture, this is how much tax you owe the government, okay? From there, they're going to back in what you've already paid, okay? So if we're, if we're working, the, the, your, your employer is going to take out automatically some tax from your pay, okay? So that is already going to be factored into that you owe. 
So the government subtracts that out because you've already paid it in through your payroll deduction, okay? And then whatever is left is the amount that will be refunded or the amount that you owe to the government. Okay, so here is the visual of this. Okay, so we have total income. So your earned income is going to be calculated first, okay? This is all the income that you make and it will be gross, okay? Then you add in the unearned income. Okay, so this is going to be things like unemployment or um, uh, trying to think of another example, but like unemployment would be the perfect example of that, of unearned income. Okay, so they're going to add these two things together to get what they call your total income. Okay, after for that, we are going to adjust the income. Okay. So if there are like, if, for example, if there are any teachers on the call, um, if you pay for supplies for your classroom, okay. And you are a teacher and you're buying that for the school and for your classroom, that would be an example of an adjustment. Okay. So the government would say, okay, well, instead of being taxed on this unearned income and this earned income that we've already reported, because you're a teacher and because you have bought these supplies for your classroom, which is a great thing to do, we are going to adjust your income. Or when I say adjust, I mean reduce. <laughs> We're going to reduce the income that you get taxed on because you've made this purchase out of pocket. That makes sense so far? Okay. All right. So we're going to do the adjust income. After those adjustments are done, that is what your adjust gross income is. Okay. All right. So then we think about your tax liability. Okay. So how much now do they say that we owe in taxes? Okay. All right. So then they're going to factor in your tax credits. Okay. So they're going to say, okay, you, we've gotten this to this level. We know what your adjustments are. We know what your tax liability is. Now we're going to factor in whatever credits you are eligible for. Okay. So if you're eligible for the earned income tax credit, that's either going to reduce your income even further that you have to report on. And with earned income credit, there's the possibility that you might even get a little bit back in your refund too, which is very cool. Okay. So once that's all factored in and the amount that you actually have paid into the government already due to payroll deduction, that is what results in the amount owed or the amount, uh, the amount, you, excuse me, the amount that you owe or the amount that you're receiving in a refund. Does that make sense to everybody, that process? I explain that okay? Just give me the little th thumbs up on your thing if it's okay. And if not, take yourself off mute and ask and I will, or put it in the chat and I will explain. Okay, I'm getting, I'm getting some thumbs up. Excellent. Okay. All right, cool. All right, so what is the basic framework of a tax return? How do they determine all of this, okay? So we're gonna start with filing statuses. So there are five filing statuses, one of which is not very often utilized. And the one that's not very often utilized is the qualifying widower. And I will talk about that um, last in this, in this little part of the presentation. Okay, so we'll start with single. But what I want to what I want to point out on this slide is essentially that the determination of this, of what your filing status is and what it properly should be, is essential to the accuracy of your return. So it's really, really important to get this part correct. Okay, and a lot of people do not. <laughs> okay. So what we are looking at here for single is on December 31st of any tax year, okay, single means, and by the way, I just want to point this out um, as an aside, these are legal designations, okay? So what I mean when I say you are not married or you're sing legally separated or divorced, that means that you are in the legal system a single person. Not that you're living separately from a spouse that you are married to, <laughs> okay? So in order to take single, you are not married. In the eyes of the law, you are divorced or legally separated, or you are widowed, okay, in this past tax year, okay? So that's what single means. The second one is married filing jointly. So we have married people, legally married, 
people, not just people living together who say that they're married. <laughs> um, so married people, legally married, or spouses living apart who are not legally separated. And there's a lot of confusion about this because I think there's, a, there's many, many people out there who think that when you stop living with someone <laughs> for any period of time, that you're allowed to take a different filing status, okay? And that is not the case under the terms of tax law, okay? So if you are still legally married, but you're not living with your spouse, you should still file as a married person, okay? And that can be married filing separately if you don't have that person's um, financial information or social security number, um, but it should be a married status, okay? Um, now, the other pieces here are separated, but you're not in a final um, legal separation or your tax, the taxpayer spouse died during the year and the taxpayer has not remarried because what they will do is if your spouse has passed in the tax year, so for 2022, when we go and do the 2023 tax return, if your spouse was alive at any point during 2022, they will allow you to claim the married filing jointly status as you did when your spouse was living um, they will allow you to take that status in that in that tax year. Okay. And that's what I was just talking about there. Okay. Um, so married filing separately. Now, this is a very interesting tax uh, situation. So in the eyes of the Internal Revenue Service, the, the married filing step status is one that causes some red flags, okay? And the reason that this causes some red flags is that the IRS will be like, hmm, why do married people want to file a separate return from each other, okay? And there's usually a couple reasons why that would be the case. One is that we have a debt that we owe, okay? That's probably the most common one, okay? So one of the spouses, and it would be a federal or state debt, okay? So one of the spouses might have back child support, one of the spouses might have back taxes or they might have back student loans. Now notice these are all federal or state um, debts that are owed um, to, to the government, okay? And once that happens, the government is able to then come in and take the refund, okay? Um, and that's usually not a great situation for anybody. And so then what happens is, is that the spouses want to file separately rather than file jointly. Okay. Now, this is a very legitimate filing status. There is nothing wrong or illegal with filing a separate return for that purpose. But just understand that if you do it this way and you have children who are eligible for earned income tax credit, that you will not be eligible to get earned income tax credit because the government does not like particularly care for this status, even though it is a legal status. <laughs> um, and so they will then provide some, um, you know, basically, you know, give people a little smack on the wrist um, by, by keeping them tax credits for filing this way, okay? All right, so uh, that's a married filing separately. So, oh, separately. so if you are a married person, you have two options, married filing jointly and married filing separately. Okay, and that's what I was just talking about there, the married filing separately piece. Okay, our third status is head of household, okay? Now, this is a very popular filing status, especially in the Volunteer Income Tax Assistance Program. What I will say, though, is that there, there's a distinction between being the head of your household or the person that is kind of in charge there and utilizing this as a filing status, okay? So in terms of a filing set, are only eligible for head of household as it relates to a qualifying child or a qualifying relative, okay? So you cannot claim a head of household filing status if you do not have people you are claiming, okay, on your tax return. You also must be unmarried on the last day of the year, okay? So um, you can't be a married person and filing file this status, except for if you meet this one criteria, and that one criteria is, is that you are a person that has experienced abandonment. And when I say abandonment, what I mean is, is that your spouse has left the home and has not returned in the six months that are the last six months of the year. Okay. So they have to leave in July. 
Okay. And then they are not to, they, they, they have not returned. Okay. But if you are currently living with your spouse and you have not been divorced, then you are not allowed to claim this filing status. Okay. Um, the other thing is, is that there's only one head of household in a household. Which means there are not two people who live together who can file a head of household filing status. Okay. And that's because what this means is that um, the taxpayer, because the last rule here is that the taxpayer must have paid more than half of the cost of keeping up the home that was the main home for the qualifying children or qualifying relatives, only one person typically is doing that, um, providing over half of the expenses. And so that's why only one head of household per, uh, per household. Okay. Does that make sense? Any questions thus far about this? Okay. I will keep that moving. <laughs> All right. Um, this is what I was just talking about. So, um, and in terms of custodial parents, so if we have children who are residing um, in multiple households, so we have two sets of parents, uh, one, the child lives with parents, uh, one parent half of the time, with the other parent the other half of the time. Typically, there are divorce decrees related to this, and there are very clearly stated guidelines in divorce decrees about who will claim children and when they will claim the children. Um, so if you are that person and you are doing an equal split, um, then you would probably have an every other year type of scenario with your ex spouse or your ex partner um, that would that would indicate when you are supposed to take the head of household status and when you are not taking the head of household status. Okay, um, qualifying widower with dependent children. So what this is is a very mildly used um filing status but essentially what this comes down to is if a person has uh had a spouse that has passed away and there are dependent children in the household we go back to the rule of the year after the spouse dies um they are able to claim the married filing jointly status again but if there are qualifying children there they're going to allow this status which is the qualifying widower with dependent children and they will allow it for the current tax year and two years after that and the reason for that is, is that um, the qualifying widower status will actually provide a higher standard deduction, which we talked about at the top of our presentation, okay? So the standard deduction is the amount of money, and it's just an amount of money that people have just for having a pulse <laughs> that the government will give you off of your taxable income, okay? So they basically say, you earned this. We're going to give you this standard deduction so you get to take your income and you get to subtract this this amount of money in the standard deduction and then instead of being taxed on your earned income plus your unearned income you're going to get taxed on that minus the standard deduction so you're basically taxed on less which is a good thing okay so for this qualifying widower with dependent child they basically allow you to take the higher standard deduction for the current year and then two years following that which is a really lovely thing um, in terms of your tax situation following um, a spouse passing away. Okay, and that gets into what I just talked about there. All right, so we're done with filing status. Are there any questions or anything that anybody wants to get clarified before we move into dependents? Okay, nothing? Okay, so dependents. All right. These are people <laughs> that live in your household um, that you are supporting financially. OK, and so one is called a qualifying child. That should be fairly self-explanatory. It's it's your younger children who are meet a couple of different criteria. Um, the IRS, of course, would not be the IRS if they didn't have complicated <laughs> rules around who qualifies for what. So we'll get into a little bit about who qualifies as a qualifying child in just a second. And then there's also this other category that is called a qualifying relative. And that deepens the, the water and muddies the water just a little bit more. So we'll get into what a qualifying relative um, includes in just a second. Okay, so who is a qualifying child in your household? Okay. 
um, key here and the Internal Revenue Service is that when they set up rules and when they write this tax law, um, very frequently they want people to meet all, and that's why you see they all underlined on the slide, they want people to meet all of the tests, not just one or two or three of them, but all of the tests in order to have this apply, okay? So for qualifying children, there's a couple of things. We have to have relationship and we have to have residency, okay? So what does the uh, relationship mean? It means that we are either blood related to the child or we are related by marriage to the child. Now, a couple of other things that can happen as well is foster children who are placed in a house uh, hold by an official agency. So that would also be a qualifying relationship um, for the relationship test, okay? So one of, those, one of those three things should apply, okay? The other piece is age, okay? We have several different ages that would qualify as a qualifying child. So one is that they're under 19. This is just your standard kid that lives in the house, okay? The next relationship is going, or excuse me, age is going to be 24 and a full-time student, okay? Not 24 and a part-time student, 24 and a full-time student in order to be up to that age limit, okay? And then the third age is that they can be any age at all as long as they are totally and permanently disabled, okay? So those are the three different ages that qualify for a qualifying child. Also, the qualifying child must be younger than the taxpayer. And I know that seems crazy, <laughs> but that would be a rule. Um, but people were, the reason all these rules exist is that people were finding loopholes to break them. <laughs> so the more things get broken, the more rules they create. Okay, so people were trying to claim everybody as qualifying children. They were trying to claim their grandparents as qualifying children. They were trying to claim their dog as qualifying children. <laughs> there was all sorts of things that were going on where now the IRS actually has to write down what a qualifying child is and that it has to be younger than the person claiming them. Okay. Um, also, the dependent cannot provide, and this is really important, the dependent cannot provide more than half of their own financial support, okay? So I have a really old example of this that will age me beyond belief, but, um, you know, I don't know if you guys remember, like, Miley Cyrus, um, you know, who was on that show, she was on that show for a little while, I forget the name of it now, but, um, so Miley Cyrus was, like, 16 or 14 or how old she was, but she was making a lot of money um, working on that TV show that she was working on. So then the question becomes, can her father, Billy Ray Cyrus, claim her as a dependent on the tax return? Okay, because she's making all of this money. The key here is that if Miley, even as a juvenile, is providing more than half of her own financial support, like AKA paying for her own housing, paying for her own food, paying for her phone, all of those pieces, transportation and all that stuff, then even despite the fact that she's the right age, Billy Ray would not be able to claim her on the return, okay? Now, if she is taking that money as a minor and she is socking it away in a savings account for a later time when she's an adult and she's not using any of that money to support herself, then Billy Ray can claim her, okay? So the key there is about the support. And what you're gonna find with tax law is that that's a really important piece to tax law. If you are providing more than half the financial support to your children, um, if they meet these age criteria, then they will allow you to claim the person, okay? The other big thing is residency. So a child must have lived with the taxpayer for more than half of a tax year, okay? So it's six months a day, essentially, right, is the minimum amount of time. So that's a really key piece. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I have a college student. They're at their college dorm for more than half the year. That's okay. If they're a college student and they're a full-time student living on campus, they would still have their permanent residency with you. So you can still claim that child with the residency clause, okay? And then there's a little thing about the at the bottom about a tiebreaker rule. Again, this gets into divorced um, or separated, legally separated parents who might claim, uh, who have a custody agreement in terms of who they claim. Um, so just keep in mind 
that there are tiebreaker rules. And if you are someone who shares custody to follow the um, custody agreement that you have in place. Okay, so here's the helpful acronym with claiming dependents. So it's called SARA. Um, so just to remember these key pieces. So support, more than half the support is very, very important. The right ages, again, that's 19 and up under 24 and under and a full-time student permanently and totally disabled okay relationship they have to be your blood or by marriage or if an officially placed child in order to have a relationship residency they have to live with you for more than half the year with the exclusion of kids that are in college and it, i forgive me also military if there's a young person that still qualifies under these other rules military would also apply as well they must meet all of those tests and they have to have more than half of the year with you, okay? So again, these rules exist because people were breaking them um, in, in years past. So um, just important thing to note there. Okay, any questions about dependents at this point? Also really, really important. And it can cause a lot of difficulty with rejected returns, okay? So for an example, what happens in VITA is that we will have a parent come into the tax center, they will fill out a tax return, and they will list dependents on it. We submit it to the Internal Revenue Service, and then it rejects, and it bounces back to us. And what, what it often will say is that this, social this child's Social Security number was already used on another person's tax return. Okay, that is problematic. Um, so that's when we have to get into it with the, with the taxpayer and figure out, okay, well, who is actually the legitimate claimer of this particular dependent? Okay, so that's when we have to ask about, are they the right age? Are they meeting the right criteria for more than half the support? Are they meeting the residency tests, right? So if that's the case and you've put a person on your return in error, you are going to have to fix that. And then, and then it could end up with the Internal Revenue Service having to sort that out um, once the returns have been submitted. Because if money is, you know, if, if refunds are, are given as on the basis of that, and then the wrong person has received the refund, there has to be a payment back and we have to rectify that situation. And that can take a very long time to sort out. I don't know if you guys have dealt with the Internal Revenue Service in terms of their processing times, <laughs> um, but they do not process things very quickly. Um, so it's, it's better to have this information up front and kind of know what we're talking about. Okay, so the next thing is taxpayers with ITIN cards. And I don't know if people know what these are, but an ITIN card is a, and it's actually a letter, it's not a card, but it's an individual taxpayer identification number. So this is for non-citizen filers um, who do not have residency in the United States who are working here and filing a tax return, okay? Um, so if you have an ITIN, what we are going to do is we are going to apply that number first in lieu of the social security number and because the IRS would still like a person to file. Um, and so we will use that number to file the tax return. If you if you need an ITIN, our VITA sites can actually help you apply for an ITIN. Okay, just stop if, if you have any questions. This is a lot of information as I said the disclaimer at the beginning. <laughs> okay. Um, so qualifying relatives, this is another level of people that you can claim um, on your tax returns, okay? So again, you'll see at the top of the slide, people need to meet all of the following tests, okay? So this has two different criteria for relationship, okay? So one is actually called relationship, and that is going to be our blood relationships and our marital relationships, okay? So if I'm married to you, or I'm married to someone and that person has a child, then that's going to be considered a relationship that I would be able to claim that child on my tax return because I'm married to the person that is their parent. Okay. Um, the other sort of relationship category is what's called member of the household. Okay. So you can claim someone who is considered to be a member of your household as long as the other criteria on this slide are met. OK, because we realize um, I do work at the IRS, I work for the village, but the IRS realizes that there's relationships in which people are just living together and someone is providing support to the other person who's living there. 
Okay. So in those situations, they don't want people not to be able to be claimed. So they've created these two different relationships, which are again, relationship, which is blood, blood or marriage, or this member of the household status. Okay. Um, so with member of the household, you can actually live in the house. Okay. Um, if you are an unrelated person, so let's say that Pam and I live together, we're not married. Um, we're just rooming together. If that's the case, and Pam lives with me for 12 months out of the year, and the rest of these rules are true, so she earns less than $4,300 in the year, she's not my qualifying child um, or the qualifying child of another person who might be claiming her, and I provided more than half the support to her, aka rent, food, all of those pieces, then I can claim Pam on my tax return as a qualifying relative, okay? Now, if it's my sister, my blood sister, okay, and she lives in Boston, which is true, my sister lives in Boston. Um, so if she's my sister and all of these things also qualify, so my sister is earning less than $4,300, she's not the qualifying child of, uh, you know, of me or of someone else, okay, and I provided more than half of her financial support during the year, I can also claim my sister, even though she lives in Boston, because she is my blood relative, okay? So that's a really important distinction. So if someone lives outside of the house that you are supporting, they do have to be related to you by blood or marriage, okay? All right, I hope this is clear, but if it's not, please, please, please stop me and ask questions. Okay. All right, so the dependency exemption, again, this gets into children of divorce, separated or never married people. Again, there are usually agreements that are come to um, when people separate and there are children in the mix. And it usually involves claiming one year on and one year off, okay? What happens though, sometimes with the, what's called the non-custodial parent, which is the parent where the child does not reside, um, they will get privileges to claim certain aspects but they will not get to claim everything. And the reason is the residency, okay? So if you have a non-custodial parent who is in the year of claiming, okay, what has to happen is, is that the parent who is the custodial parent will need to release the exemption to that non-custodial. Okay, so let me make this a, an example. Okay, so Pam and I, are we were married, we have a child, we got divorced, okay? So I'm the custodial parent. So the child lives with me all year. But Pam has, you know, visiting rights, weekends, all that good stuff, okay? And Pam gives me money to help me raise our child, okay? All good things, all good things. Okay, so we have an agreement with our divorce that year one, I'm going to claim, year two, Pam is going to claim, year three, I claim, year four, Pam claims, okay, on the tax return, okay? But what ends up happening is, is that Pam, because our child does not live with Pam, remember, we have residency rules. Someone has to live with somebody for more than half of the year in order to claim things like EITC, <laughs> okay? So what's going to happen is Pam will get to claim the child on her return in terms of what's called a personal exemption amount, which is only up to a certain dollar value will not get to claim for earned income tax credit because as the custodial parent where the child sleeps and lives and goes to school and does all that stuff, I will still get to claim those important credits. Okay. Does that make sense? All right. Okay. And that was what I was just discussing, the non-custodial parent. And me as the custodial parent, I will need to file a form. And that form is called the 8333. I think I can't see it's behind all of you. The number 8332. <laughs> um, in order to release what's called the release of claim of exemption, which was, which is what I was just talking about. So when I file my return, I'm going to provide that form in order to allow Pam to claim in the year that she's claiming. Okay, moving right along. And Yadira and Pam do keep me abreast of the time because as you know, I am a chatty Kathy. So I can go on forever <laughs> and I will uh, miss the time break. You have five minutes left. Oh yes. my goodness. Yes, you do. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
Oh, fun. All right. So we don't need to get into income because income is really easy. Income is basically taxable or not taxable. <laughs> and there is a list of that. Um, and your, your tax per, uh, preparer will know um, what is uh, something that is taxable and what is something that is not taxable. But they also have a huge list of that on irs.gov. Okay, so I'm going to stop because uh, it's a lot of information already. I hope I've given you guys the basics of sort of what is the baseline of a quality tax return. And I will open it up to any questions that you guys have brought with you this evening. You guys are quiet. That was I a know. lot of information. Yeah, that was a lot. Question. And you can always put it in the chat. Oh, that was a lot. Go ahead. Huh? Laura, what yes. is the, I have a question for you. What is the um, minimum, no, the, yeah, minimum amount you have to make in order to have to file? Oh, that's a great question. And my my updated 4012, which is our which is what we refer to in Vita lovingly as the Bible um, <laughs> with all the tax law in it, um, is not out yet. Um, it comes out in in uh, right around Thanksgiving, but it's usually around about twelve thousand um, dollars. It's and could be a little bit up from that at this point, um, just because you know every year there's sort of increases, incremental increases to that, but. Um, but yeah, I think it is about $12,000 if you're a single person that you make, if you make under that, you do not have to officially file a tax return. Now, don't quote me on it. IRS.gov is your friend. So if you need to know, look that you can look it up on IRS.gov. But it might be worth it for you to still file to get yes. a credit. Is that true? That is correct. Yes. Okay. So, you know, if you are eligible for things called refundable credits, okay, so not all the credits are refundable. Some of them are called non-refundable. All right, so the difference between those two is refundable means that actual cash um, might either be reducing how much you owe the government or it's actually going to be money in your refund check. Okay, so that's the refundable part. If it's non-refundable credit, what it's going to do is it's just going to reduce the amount of tax that you owe. So it's not going to necessarily come back in the form of cash to you in your refund, but it will reduce the amount that you actually owe them or your tax liability as we clap. Thanks for those questions, Pam. I think Alexander um, must have probably had a question and I interrupted. Do you have a question that you want to post? Or Alexander, just come off your mute. Okay, maybe not. <laughs> All right. Well, the other great thing about this is two things. Um, the great thing about this is, is that if you go to a reputable tax preparer or if you come and utilize VITA services, is volunteering tax assistance. We are trained and certified every year. We have to. I've been doing tax return preparation for 20 years. Every year I have to get recertified with the Internal Revenue Service. Um, I have to pass a test. I have to take an ethics exam. I have to do the whole thing every year in order to do volunteer income tax assistance. Um, so that's a really good thing. So if you go to a reputable preparer, you're going to get all of these questions answered for you. But what we like to be able to do is empower you, right? Because you're, you know, this whole series, this whole three-part series is really about of giving you the information that you need to be able to function in your life financially independently, right? And if even if you don't have all the answers, you know the right questions to ask, right? So the reason I want you to know about filing status, the reason I want you to know about the proper way to claim dependence is, is that when you go to your preparer, if you don't feel comfortable doing it yourself, you know the questions to ask them. And, you know, and you'll know like, huh, well, you know, I learned that dependents are supposed to be claimed for this. And you don't have a dependent on my return. What is that about? You know, so even if you're not doing it yourself, you 
you have the information at your fingertips to be able to go, I'm an informed consumer. I know what I what I want to ask you about. I'm aware of what my financial status should be. So answer this question for me, would you? Um, so that's the really important thing here. And that's the part of empowerment that we're really trying to provide in this in this series. Right, Pam? Exactly. And um, so, yeah, the more you can learn, even if it's one little tidbit of this tax information, someday will come in handy for you. And you'll be like, oh, wait, I heard that. I think I can claim that. Or <laughs> Your dog <Bella> agrees. <laughs> yeah, he agreed. <laughs> agrees. Your dog agrees. <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> that was I kind of time. <laughs> But I listen to this um, whenever Laura talks about taxes. I learn something new every time. So, yeah. Um, oh, I did have one question too, Laura. That um, for what is the income, um, the maximum amount you can make to come to use Vita to do your taxes? Yes, thank you for that. So it's sixty thousand this year. Um, they oh. up it. Every, they up it every single year. Um, the um, and what we utilize is the cap for the earned income tax credit. Um, that's how we determine, um, you know, if you're eligible for VITA or not eligible for VITA. Now, that being said, if someone came to us with $61,000 or 62 or even 65, um, we're not going to turn that person away um, because, you know, clearly you've come to utilize VITA um, and we want to be able to help you. So, um, you know, but what we want to avoid is someone that makes a lot of money um, coming to VITA. Mm-hmm when they could, you know, use a paid pair or an accountant or something like that. So, um, so yeah, so that's what it is. Um, again, it's $60,000 is going to be the cap for the earned income tax credit. So this is basically where the credit will phase out. So you would not be eligible for the credit after that dollar value. Um, and it's actually like, to be honest with you, it's actually like 59 and some change. We round it up. Um, but at that point, it would not be a, a, a credit that you can claim anymore. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. And if by around tax time, by around tax time, if you think about, oh, wait, they said about somewhere I could go where I can get my taxes done for free and you yes. don't remember the name, know that you can always call 211 and they will direct you exactly where the VITA location is around you, around Absolutely. your location. And also Think about me, Yadira. I know I have Yadira's email somewhere and she will okay. tell me what the name is and what the information is. We always promote it around the time of, of tax season. So please always feel free to uh, look at me as a support and as a resource for anything that you need. I could always connect you to the ladies or connect you to any other resource um, that you are um, in need of. So again, thank you so much, Laura and Pam. This has been wonderful. You guys are absolutely amazing. Every time that we do this financial workshop is always amazing. I um, um, just put a challenge to you guys participating to always spread the word, right? Talk about what you learned with family members, with your friends, with your kids, and let them know, right? Because you might uh, have learned or gained some knowledge that they might not be aware of, uh, but always um, use Pam and um, Laura as a resource, right? To always be able to, to ask questions when you need to. As I shared before, there is a fourth optional session that's going to happen November 9th at the East Hartford Library, 840 Main Street, um, lower level from six to seven. That will be amazing. It will be in person. You will get to meet the ladies in person and get to ask questions and just get to network. So please come out. We will provide dinner. Um, and if you do have small children at home, don't hesitate to not come because of that. Um, we will have some of our youth employment, um, youth babysitting in a room next door um, and having activities with the kids. If you do have to bring them in, please don't let that be a barrier. Come on down and benefit from that information. So again, thank you so much. And I will stay in touch with everyone um, who was able to participate in all sessions and earn the gift card, you will hear from me on where um, and when to pick up, okay? Okay.
Thank you. Thank you, guys. Have a great evening. Hope to see you in a couple weeks. Yes. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Have a good night. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.